All right, all right. Well, welcome back this evening. It's good to be here again. Um, I have been encouraged uh, very often when I come to speak at a conference or a retreat. Um, I, I do a lot of work getting ready, getting prepared to serve the, um, uh, the church. And um, one of the blessings of this retreat is that uh, our family has been blessed, our family has been encouraged. Uh, you have ministered to me by your kindness, by your grace. Uh, those of you that I've met, we've had an opportunity to get to know you a little bit. And uh, just being encouraged by the worship team and the other leaders here at this retreat. So thank you for uh, your kindness to myself and to my family. And um, I'm looking forward to, we still got another couple messages, as well as uh, tonight's campfire and tomorrow morning service. So let's uh, come before the Lord in prayer this evening and ask his blessing on our time together. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your goodness and your grace in our lives. Lord, we thank you that this Christian life is, is not all about us, but about you and by the power that uh, you accomplish in us and through us. Lord, we pray that uh, we would be constantly returning to our reliance upon you, to our dependence on you as our Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray that this evening, God, you would uh, grant us strength uh, for myself as I read your word and as I preach it, and uh, for those who are here, that uh, they will listen and apply and, and find truths that will make uh, an impact in their everyday lives. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, one of the, the ministries at our church, we call it Greenhouse, and uh, what we do is we, um, we have church planters or their families, they come to us from uh, all over uh, the world even, and they come to our church and we have about two or three uh, years with them where we're training them in pastoral ministry, we're getting them to know them and their families, uh, we're showing them what a, a small church looks like from behind the scenes and they're getting experience in, in worship and in preaching and in leading and, and starting new ministries and, and um, it's an exciting time but, but as we get closer and closer to the, the date when they're about to leave uh, we start to prepare for uh, what it's going to look like in that future church plant and so um, we, we do practical things like we, we help them to start a website or we talk about this is what small groups, um, this is how you form them. Uh, we, we also uh, kind of minister to them by, by helping them spiritually get themselves ready to, uh, to leave our church and, and to start a, a new church somewhere else. Uh, we show them what it's like to gather a core team and, and how to do evangelism and how to start uh, from, from the beginning and, and, and get to the place where, where they're gathering a church together that will praise the Lord in whatever place it is that they're going to. Uh, but one of the most vital things that we do, one of the most vital things that we do in preparing church planters for ministry is teaching them how to gather a prayer team in order to send them out. And uh, one of the things we, we do at our church is, is we say, you know, we're going we're gonna to be praying for you, but not only are we praying for you, but, but we're going to have this constant communication where, where you are sharing with us the, the types of things that you need prayer for and the, the ways that we can encourage you. And, and we have people that are dedicated to pray on specific days of the month in order uh, to remind this person, this, this family that has gone out to plant a church, uh, that we love them, but also that we are supporting them in ways that we can through the ministry of prayer. And so this, this evening, as we think about these building blocks uh, for the church, uh, we, we've talked about a number of building blocks, but, but one that we haven't got to quite yet is the building block of prayer. Well, when you are seeking to rebuild a church or a ministry or, or even begin to rebuild some of the things in your own life, you, you, you must be dependent upon the Lord in prayer. And so uh, this evening we're going to be looking at the idea of prayer as our life's breath. Uh, because very much so, prayer is as important to our spiritual lives as breathing is to our physical lives. And so the words, let's pray, should always constantly <coughs> be on our lips. It should be spoken by Christians whenever we're coming together. 
Now you might ask, well, why pray together? And why not just pray on our own? Why not just pray by ourselves? You know, many of us would rather pray on our own in our private times with the Lord than to pray in corporate gatherings. How is corporate prayer an essential element to the rebuilding process? And so today we're going to consider four vital reasons why the church must pray together. Uh, first of all, praying together has always been the pattern of God's people. Praying together identifies the church's character. So when you think about the people of God, we are prayer, they, we are praying people. We, we are, we are uh, from creation. God spoke with Adam and Eve. You remember Adam and Eve, they're in the Garden of Eden, they're walking with God in the cool of the day. They're talking with God. They're, they're praying to Him. They're in relationship with Him. Ever since the beginning in the Garden of Eden, that's how it was. The first man and the first woman were living in relationship with God. Their God. And even after they fell into sin, God still sought a relationship with man. God still sought a relationship with mankind. He, he said to Adam and Eve, where are you? Are, are you hiding because of what you've done? Have you eaten of the fruit that I, I, I told you not to eat of it? And God is pursuing Adam and Eve and he's drawing them back into a relationship with himself. And so, so prayer has been from the beginning the creature's conversation with the Creator. And yet God's people have also prayed together uh, from even uh, uh, the beginning of the world. In the days of Seth, Genesis 4, verse 26, it says that people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And what's that, what's that speaking of is, is that the people of God, the, the people who are following after God, began to pray. They began to call upon His name. And this is not the people that were living their own way, the, the people that were living in wickedness, but the people of God began to call on the name of the Lord, the name of Yahweh. And so these children of Seth were set apart from their godless neighbors in order to unite together in prayer to the Lord. And then through Abraham, God chose a special nation, the nation of Israel. And God chose this special nation to have a relationship with Him, to, to interact with Him in, in terms of the offerings and the sacrifices and the tabernacle and later on the temple. And they would come to Him in prayer. And so God's people from the time of Abraham would, would pray to Him and, and call out to Him. In Exodus, we read how God's people, they collectively groaned while they were in slavery in Egypt. They, they prayed to Him. They, they cried out to Him. They called for Him to help. They, they worshipped Him. They even sang praises to Him while they were enslaved in the land of Egypt. They, they chanted psalms in, in corporate worship. They, they prayed with Solomon at the dedication of the temple. They, they continued to worship God. Even during the exile, there was a, a remnant of faithful believers who continued to pray for the sake of the nation. We read of Daniel and his three friends, of Esther and Mordecai, of, of uh, Jeremiah the weeping prophet, and as Israel returned to the land, there were leaders like Ezra and Nehemiah who reestablished the pattern of fasting and corporate prayer to the Lord. In all of these, you will notice, they prayed not just as individuals, they prayed as the corporate body of God's People. And so, so as we think about these prayers, they were practicing prayer as a corporate activity. That's what Jesus taught his disciples. He taught them how to pray. When they were all together, he taught them how to pray. And, and, and he taught them both by example and by instruction. He prayed with them as a group of disciples, but he also taught them how to pray in a body, and he would serve as a mediator to the Father on their behalf. And, and so, <coughs> just as um, Jesus said, God's house will be a house of prayer, uh, so also we are calling the church, the people of God, to come together in corporate prayer as a way of rebuilding these uh, ministries and, and this church. Likewise, we see in the book of Acts that God's people also prayed together. 28 chapters in the book of Acts, corporate prayer is mentioned at least 20 times throughout the book of Acts. For example, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, all of these 
with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. And so they're there in the upper room. They're preparing uh, for, for the Holy Spirit to come and they're praying together. They're gathered together and, and, and the one thing that they choose to do while they're waiting on the Holy Spirit is to pray as a corporate body. After Christ's ascension, they they pray as they select an apostle to replace Judas. After Pentecost, they're praying, Acts 2.42, in the the community of, of new believers. And we see this early church, it is characterized by their corporate prayers to the Lord. We read in Acts how they prayed before meals. They prayed as they sat in the temple that they prayed in the middle of the night while, while Peter was in prison. Remember, he was in, in prison, and, uh, and they're praying in, in that, that room, and, um, and, and this angel comes and sets Peter loose from prison, and Peter shows up at the door and knocks on the door, and they're having this prayer meeting and say, uh, not now, we're praying, right? They're, they're so busy in prayer that they don't even have time to open the door for Peter, who is released in a miraculous way. They're praying for boldness. When they're faced with persecution in Acts chapter 4, they pray for boldness that they might have the the, the power to proclaim the gospel even to their enemies. They pray for spirit filling. When the church was planted in Samaria, that they prayed that the spirit would come down on these new believers in Samaria just as the spirit had come down on the Jews at Pentecost to show that the Samaritans, these half-breeds, were also part of the kingdom of God. That they, they prayed for missions when they sent out Barnabas and Saul. Remember in Acts 13, the, the, the church in Antioch, this, this multi-ethnic church that's going to the nations with their church planters, they chose the best among them. Saul, Barnabas, a few others, and they said, we're going to send out our best as missionaries to the nations. And what did they do? They prayed for them. They prayed for them as they sent them out. They prayed for them as they chose who was going to go. They, they prayed for them and supported them as missionaries who were going out to plant new churches. Prayer was the special priority of the apostles. And so they prayed. They prayed in Philippi. Remember Paul, when when he met those devout women by the the, the riverside, those women were praying, and and Paul comes alongside them, and they start to pray. And and they pray as the believers gathered in Philippi. They they prayed as the church. And then then even when Paul and Silas were put in prison, what did they do? They prayed, and they sang praises to the Lord. And when the jailer came to Christ at midnight, I'm sure that they prayed with him as well. Paul prayed with the Ephesian elders. Acts chapter 20, when he met with the Ephesian elders for the last time, they they wept together. He gave them some exhortations. He he spoke to them the the word of God, but, but when they were leaving one another for perhaps the very last time, they prayed as a corporate body. We see that all throughout the book of Acts, these, these, these churches, these, these apostles, these Christians, they are praying together. Uh, Paul gave thanks for the food abo- aboard the ship to Rome. He, he prayed for the, the father of Publius. Remember on the island of Malta, that, that guy got really sick, and, and, and he prayed for him to get well, and he became well. And, and saw, uh, Paul prayed with the brothers in Rome. When he met with them in Rome and he traveled to meet with them, he, he prayed together with the church in Rome. And so all throughout the book of Acts, we see how the church is gathering together corporately in prayer. And God used those early Christians, I believe he used them to advance the gospel, to proclaim the good news, to make a difference in the Roman Empire. Not because they were so great, not because they were so many, not because they had all the greatest strategies and uh, wonderful techniques. God used them because they were empowered through the Spirit because of their dependence upon the Lord in prayer. And so these Christians, just like us, they were not extraordinary. They were just normal, everyday Christians, but they had the power of God because they were relying upon God in prayer. They were calling upon the Lord together. In Paul's letters, he repeatedly exhorts the church to pray together. You, you read about the prayers of Paul. You read about his exhortations to pray. And he's always using plural pronouns. He's always talking about we and us and, and gathering them together. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 25, Brothers, you all pray for us. You all pray without ceasing. Uh, You all pray uh, constantly. You all continue steadfastly in prayer. Whenever Paul is talking about prayer and calling the church to pray, he is calling for them to do it together. 
And so one of the reasons why we should gather together corporately for prayer, not just in our own individual uh, prayer closets, is because it is a biblical calling. Praying together has always been the pattern of God's people throughout history, and this pattern will continue on uh, into eternity future. Uh, because we see that in heaven, heaven is a place of never-ending praise and prayer to our King. Uh, prayer, uh, uh, heaven is a place where we will never stop praying together just because we have made it to glory. And so let's keep up this practice now. Let's gather together in prayer and say to one another, let's pray. So the first reason we pray together is to identify the church's character. It's who we are. Secondly, Praying together also unites the church in love. Praying together unites the church in love. You know, all across this nation, you're going to find places of worship where fanatics chant in unison the names of their gods and they spend their money trying to appease those gods. And those worship venues are called football stadiums. Uh, football season is upon us and, and uh, college football, pro football, American style football, global football. There's football all over the world. And these, in essence, are places of corporate worship corporate prayer, corporate praises, and, and yet if the world system can carry on that kind of power, consider the power of a praying church. Consider the power of a church that is calling upon the God of the universe to do something in our lives and in our ministries and in our churches. The word corporate, it comes from the Latin word corpus, or body, like corpse. And so corporate prayer speaks of praying together as a church body. Not one that's dead, but one that's alive. Prayer connects us through our common unity, our communion in Jesus Christ. It connects us through our common mission to proclaim the gospel to the nations. <coughs> and so... Um, uh, the church in Acts chapter 4, they prayed this, Acts 4, 29, And now, Lord, grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Because the church in Acts, they knew that, that only through prayer, only through calling upon the Lord for his strength, for his power, for his boldness, could they make a difference in evangelism. Prayer unites us. You know, prayer is the great equalizer. Right? There's all kinds of different people in this room, at this retreat, at CIBC. Uh, there's all kinds of different people with all kinds of different authority structures and relationships and things like that. But prayer is the great equalizer. You know, as we kneel around the throne of grace, we're all, we're all the same level. We're, we're all equally humbled before the Lord. We are all His children. We are all coming before Him in prayer. And that is something that we can share as the body of Christ. Prayer reminds us that we are equally needy. We all need God. We are also equally welcome before God's throne. There's none of us, none of the children of God, that, that God says, no, I don't want to talk to you right now. I'm not interested in hearing what you have to say. Prayer, prayer reminds us that all of us have equal access to the throne of grace. And prayer then assures us that we are equally useful. You might have all kinds of excuses. Well, I'm too young. Uh, I'm too inexperienced. I just became a Christian. I don't pray very well. I don't have eloquent speeches that I can bring before the Lord. I, I'm not a very strong Christian. You might have all kinds of reasons why you feel like you're not worthy to come before the Lord. But what prayer does is, is prayer, uh, prayer says, God wants to talk to you. God wants to hear from you. God wants you to come before Him in prayer. And sometimes in the church, we, we get into this idea that, that, um, that the movers and shakers in the church are the people that God wants to talk to. You know, I'm, I'm a pastor, and it's weird. Like, I go to a barbecue, and, and I'm always the one that gets asked to pray because I'm the pastor. Um, but, I, but I say, you know, He hears your prayers just as much as He hears mine. Right? He, he talks to you, and you talk to Him just as much as, as He talks to me. I, I don't have, you know, I, I, I don't bless the... the you know, the, the steak and, and hot dogs just any better than you do. The, the, the Lord knows that, that you also have access to Him in prayer. And, and sometimes we have to remind each other of that, but, but you might be in that situation where you're saying, well, there's, there's people that have a, a, a closer access to God than I do. Prayer reminds us that it's not about being the most powerful preacher. 
Not, they're not about being the, the, the oldest person in the church. Not about being a visionary leader that, that God says, I want to talk to that person. Prayer says God wants to talk to you. And God wants to hear from you. You remember Epaphras, Colossians chapter 4. Paul considered Epaphras not a subordinate, but a fellow worker. A fellow worker for the gospel. Why? Because he says, Epaphras labored in prayer on behalf of the church. The thing that set apart Epaphras was, was that he was a prayer warrior. He, he was somebody that, 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 that had access to God and was constantly having a conversation with God. And, and that's what he was commended for. And so sometimes we think, well, well I don't do anything in the church. I, I don't have the ability to do uh, mighty works of God in the church. But, but just like Epaphras, you can be strong in prayer. And you can come before the Lord in prayer. And you can encourage the rest of your church to pray as well. A uh, prayer reminds us that um, we're not living in a, a results-driven church, but the, the Bible reminds us that prayer is the foundational work of the church. And so why then is it hard for us to pray? You know, we, we talk about what the, the Bible says, you've got to pray, you should be praying, it's good for you to pray, God says, I want you to pray. But then we see just our everyday experience, and it's hard for us to pray. Why do we hesitate to pray? Why do we hesitate especially to practice corporate prayer, gathering together with the body of Christ to pray corporately? Donald Whitney is an author. He points out this contradiction. There are many who are quick to ask for prayer from people in the church and who will even pray for others in return, but who will not commit themselves to pray with these same brothers and sisters. You know, we, we share our prayer requests all the time. We, we ask people to pray for us. But, but how often do we just get together and say, let's pray. Let's, let's gather together in prayer. Praying together requires self-sacrifice. It requires the sacrifice of our time. It requires the sacrifice of our routine. We need to defer our, our, our creature comforts to show up at a certain place at a certain time with certain people, a real community of people, not just on Zoom, right? And, and, and what that means is that it's hard. Uh, we're trying to do this at our church right now. We're trying to find a time when we can pray corporately. And what we're, what we're finding is that <coughs> everybody's got a different, uh, a different uh, reason why they can't make it at this particular time, at that particular time. And, and, and we're finding it's really hard to organize corporate prayer. And, and yet God's church should be always striving to be together in prayer. No matter how often we pray for others uh, from a distance, like the Apostle Paul writes in his letters to the churches, uh, I long to be with you. I long to be present with you. I long to pray with you and to minister to you and to care for your soul. That's the, the burden of our hearts. And so as we labor shoulder to shoulder before the throne of grace, we, we bear each other's burdens. We come before the Lord and say, God, I want you to hear from this person. And I want you to hear from this person. And I want you to tell you about this other person in the church. And, and let me bring them before you so that you can answer their prayers as well as mine. And we grow together in unity. And we rejoice with those who rejoice. And we weep with those who weep. And, and we, we see the church draw closer together when we are working together in prayer. And so the challenge of the day is this, to commit a regular, consistent time each week when you will gather together for extended prayer with fellow believers in your church. Uh, you might already have that. You might already have prayer meetings, and that's great. They just keep doing that. Uh, but you might say, well, you know, I, I pray on my own, but I don't pray with other people. I don't pray with a small group. I don't pray with a, 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 prayer, a prayer meeting. I don't pray with other fellow believers on a regular basis. The challenge of the day is to find a way for you to do that on a consistent basis and to see the, the wonders of corporate prayer in your church. Praying together is the biblical pattern. Praying together unites the church together. Third, praying together disciples the church in faith. It disciples the church in faith. You know what happens when you pray together? You learn from each other. You learn how to pray. You learn how not to pray as well. Uh, you, you learn um, how to encourage one another, how to equip each other, how to teach each other. You know, most of us, you think about how, how we learn how to pray. Most of us learn how to pray from our parents, 
or from a, a Christian leader, maybe a, maybe a friend who was mature in their faith. We, we learned how to pray from other people. We didn't just kind of figure it out on our own. Uh, someone might have led you. If you were a child, someone might have led you phrase by phrase through those first halting prayers and said, you know, just repeat after me and, and just pray these prayers. And, and then they instructed you to grow in your prayers. They, <coughs> they instructed you to, uh, uh, to come before the Lord and, and, and to maybe, maybe you, you go through the, um, the acronym ACTS, A-C-T-S, Adoration, Confession, Thanksgiving, and Supplication, and, and just instructing you how to step by step come before the Lord in prayer. These are opportunities for you to grow. Along the way, as you pray, you're learning basic theology. As you're listening to people pray who, who have a relationship with God, who have talked with God, who, who know God's Word, they're, they're teaching you by their prayers, even just basic theologies about how to talk to God. And, and, and when you've spent time with some of those senior saints in the church and you've prayed together with them, you're learning about suffering. You're learning about hardship. You're learning how to pray to God even in the midst of your pain. You're learning about lament. You're learning how to praise God and all the, the, the wonderful um, different types of vocabulary that you can use to praise the Lord. It's a different language. When you are spending time with re people who really know how to pray, you are learning how to pray yourself. You know, sometimes people uh, pass on a method for prayer, you know, how and when and where, but, but really a lot, of, a lot of prayer is just more caught than taught. A lot of prayer is just spending time with other people in prayer meetings and learning as you go and learning as you listen and uh, praying together is a kind of discipleship because you learn how to pray as you pray with others. And so some of us, we, we say, well, I don't know how to pray that well. I, I feel uncomfortable. I don't, I don't want to speak out when I'm praying in public. And, and, and the truth is the best way that you can grow in your prayer life is actually to be with others as you pray. And you teach others also by, by praying with them. And so in praying together, we disciple one another. We strengthen each other's faith. We testify to our experience in God. We shape one another's repentance and desires. We stir one another to thanksgiving. We encourage one another in godly habits. We help one another to resist temptation. Praying together is a school for the entire Christian life. Prayer disciples the church by training us in faith. <coughs> you think about John chapter 11. Remember John chapter 11, Jesus is there. Um, why did Jesus pray aloud at the tomb of Lazarus before he raised him from the dead? You ever, you ever wonder about, you know, God, you know, he's God's son. He, I mean, he's got an access to the Father. He could pray in his mind and, and God would still hear him. But, but Jesus prays aloud. He doesn't pray silently off to the side. Jesus prayed aloud in part to strengthen his disciples' faith. Uh, John writes in John 11, uh, 41 and 42, Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, and I've got perfect faith. But I said this, I said this prayer publicly. I said it aloud on account of the people standing around. Why? So that they may believe that you sent me. And Jesus tells us right here, the reason why he's praying aloud, the reason why he's praying with other people in the room is he's praying aloud for the sake of those around him. Because the very act of prayer proclaimed to others the God dependence of our Savior's faith. And, and this doesn't mean that, that when you pray, you're praying as a performance, you're praying for other people to, to hear, but, but what it's saying is that, that, that sometimes we have to be intentional in praying aloud, in praying in public, in praying together with other people, recognizing that, that not only is it an opportunity for us to come before the Lord, but it's also an opportunity for discipleship. Uh, one of the things that, that I do in uh, worship services on Sunday mornings, I always, before I preach, I have a pastoral prayer. And in this pastoral prayer, um, I will pray for the needs of our church and for our church to be, to be focused and, and prepared of heart that Sunday. But, but I also pray for ministry partners that we have maybe in the States or around the world. I, I pray for other churches that are worshiping at the same time as us in, in the valley where we minister. 
You know, I, I pray for, uh, for, for God uh, to do a work, and I, and I maybe go to different passages and, and pray about who God is and what He has done, because in the pastoral prayer itself, as I'm ministering to my congregation, I, I'm also discipling them in how to pray and what to pray for and, and how to come before the Lord in earnest appeal for God to do something. And, and so the same is true, whether you have a prayer meeting just within your home, or you have a prayer meeting within your youth group, or, or you have a prayer meeting that, that's all church-wide, uh, you are coming together, not just to come before the Lord, but also to disciple one another in your faith. You know, praying is hard, right? Praying is, is hard. It's, it's an act of faith, a faith in an unseen God. I'm, you know, you think about prayer, you're praying to a God that you cannot see, a God who is spirit, and yet praying with others reminds us that we're not alone in this. It reminds us that if we're crazy, at least we're all crazy together because we're all praying to the same unseen God. We're not the only ones who are foolish enough to address this God who we cannot see. Praying together, it strengthens our faith. It silences our nagging doubts. It reminds us that we are in this together. Praying together guards us also against the sin of prayerlessness. You know, there's something about having a scheduled prayer meeting. When, when you know that, I, I don't feel like going today, you know that people are going to figure out that you're not there. You, you know that people are going to recognize that you are absent of the prayer meeting. And so sometimes just having a scheduled time to pray with fellow believers is a form of accountability. It draws you into prayer. It says, I, I, I'm not ready to go. I don't want to go today, but I'm going to go and I'm going to make the most of the time that I have in prayer. Praying together reminds us that others are just as God-dependent as we are. Another thing that praying together does, it also trains our theology. You think about prayer. If prayer is talking to God, but then you have to know God's Word. You have to know who the God it is that you're praying to. You have to know theology proper, the doctrine of God, His attributes. And so, parents, you are teaching your children theology. You are training them in understanding the character of God as you pray to this God who is marvelous and wonderful and, and the creator of the universe. And as you pray to, to Him for who He is and what He's done, you are training your children to think about God in right ways. Sunday school teachers, you know, you prepare your lessons. You, you have everything ready to go to teach the children in your classes, and yet do you realize that you are also teaching them through your prayers? You are also teaching them about God by the way that you address God in your prayers. Disciplers and counselors, the words that you say to God in the presence of others is just as vital as the words that you say to them. True praying is an activity that is built on theology. You remember Mary, the mother of Jesus, <laughs> in Luke chapter 1, she, she prays a prayer. Actually, she sings a song, but it's kind of like a prayer to God. It's Mary's Magnificat, and, and she's singing these public praises to God. What does she do? She magnifies the Lord. She rejoices in His kindness. She delights in the God who has blessed her, and she praises God for who He is and what He's done in exalting the lowly and, and making them special in His eyes. She sings out her theology theology in public. And this theology, it's recorded in Luke chapter 1 for us to read. But what's amazing about Mary's Magnificat is that if you read it closely, you will understand that she was drawing upon the Old Testament scriptures from a woman by the name of Hannah who also had a son by a miraculous birth. And as Hannah praises the Lord, Mary reads that in scripture and she's allowing that to inform her theology which then informs her prayer and her praises. And so when we read about Mary's Magnificat in Luke chapter 1, we are drawing from Mary who was drawing from Hannah who was drawing from other saints of old and what we are seeing just in the prayers of the saints throughout history is this passing down of theology from one person to the next from one church to the next from one Christian saint to the next all throughout history prayer is a way to disciple others in right theology and then lastly praying together trains us to be thankful 
It trains us to be thankful. You know, one of uh, my, my, my boys, they, 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 we, we've, we've been praying together as a family for some time, and, and one of the most common ways that, that their prayers begin is, is thank you, God, for this. Thank you, God, for that. They, they are always thankful for what God is doing in our life as a family, and, and, and we can do that in our prayers. Part of prayer is thanksgiving. It is praise. It is expressing our gratitude to God. And, and sometimes we come to the prayer meeting. We're just, you know, our hearts aren't right yet. But, but we can get our hearts right by just starting to thank God for all His many blessings. To thank Him for, for the things that He has done. To, to thank Him for the ways that we can be grateful to Him. Whether for who He is or for how He's working in our lives or what He's uh, accomplishing in our churches. We can praise God in thanks. Psalm 136 verse 3. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords for His steadfast love endures forever. And so why should Christians pray together? Because it's the biblical pattern. Because it unites the church in love because it disciples the church in faith, finally, praying together strengthens the church's influence. You think about a church, you want influence. You want a ministry. You want to reach lost people. You want to transform lives. You want to make disciples who make disciples of others. The church prays corporately in public worship. As the preacher preaches, the congregation is praying, Lord, what does your word have to say to me today? How can I apply what I'm learning today? It's an interactive experience as public prayer becomes the joint and humble supplication of hundreds of penitent and believing souls as the word is preached and all of them, the preacher and the congregation, are engaging in this pouring out of their hearts to God in salvation. And so when you see people in church... You can pray for them. You can intercede for them. You can go up to them and say, hey, is there something that I could be praying for? Is there, is there a way that I can intercede to the Lord on your behalf? Or you may not even have a conversation with them, but you see them across the, the room and you can tell, oh, man, that person's having a hard day. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to intercede for them. I'm asking God to, to help turn their day around. Or maybe you know their situation. And maybe you know that they're going through a hard time, a season in life which is very difficult. And, and you can pray for that person, either with them or for them. Uh, you can pray for your fellow church members. One of the things that we do is we, uh, we have in our church a membership directory of just different pictures of people in our churches. And we just say, you know, take this membership directory. There's maybe ten people on a page. Pray for one page a week. You know, or, or, or pray for one person a day. And, and, and as we're praying for these different members in our churches, we, we, are, we are bringing them to the Lord in prayer, but it also puts on our hearts a desire to help them, a desire to care for them, a desire to love them in tangible ways. Or, or maybe we don't even know them, or, or maybe we haven't talked to them for a while. And so as we're praying for them, it, it triggers in our mind, uh, okay, we've got to talk to this person. We've got we to send them a text. Hey, can I be praying for you? How are you doing? Uh, what's going on in your life? And, and, and so it reminds us that, that we are praying for one another as a church. And this requires, of course, that you be present not neglecting to meet together, as Hebrews 10 tells us. You cannot pray together as a church if you are not present with the church. And so, so I want to encourage you. I, I told you earlier the challenge of the day is to find a consistent place to pray. For some of you, that might be your small group. Maybe you have a small group fellowship where you gather together, you study the scriptures. But, but as you study the scriptures, look for the patterns of prayer in scripture. Uh, listen to how the, the people in the scriptures pray to the Lord. Uh, listen to mature believers as they pray within your small group. Learn from them. Listen to the kinds of prayers that they pray and, and, and start to emulate them in your own prayers. Uh, another thing that you can do in a small group is to think ahead of what you're going to pray for. I know that sounds kind of weird. A lot of us think that prayer has to be spontaneous. It's okay to think about what you're going to pray for. It's okay to plan out some of the things that are on your heart that you want to bring before the Lord. And you might write those things down or you might have a list in your head. Uh, but, but to come to the prayer meeting ready. To come to the small group prepared to pray. Uh, it might be a verse from your devotions. It might be an application from a recent sermon. It might be a petition for certain people that are going through trials or hardships in your church. It might be an unsaved friend that you want to pray for. 
And, and as you pray, um, as you pray for in your small groups, uh, realize that, that all your life is kind of preparing for this. You, you can pray aloud in private and we'll give you the confidence to pray in public. It's, it's kind of like practice. Right? Some of us are, are nervous about praying together in a small group, praying together in public. And, and so one of the things you can do is just, just talk to God. Talk to, uh, sometimes, sometimes when I'm on my own or I'm just walking uh, down the street, I'll just pray aloud. And I'll just pray to the Lord. And sometimes praying aloud, when you hear your own voice, it, it, it teaches you how to pray in public because you're used to now hearing your voice speaking forth the prayers that you have for the Lord. So come ready to pray. Secondly, when you pray in public, be clear. Be clear. Uh, you don't want to be rambling in prayer. You don't want to be praying for ten things all at once. Uh, just pick one thing, one thing at a time, and just pray for that one thing and be clear about it. Uh, God understands what you're saying, but not everybody else does. And so in order to be helpful for the small group prayer, think about how can I be praying in a way that's clear, that's specific, that's going to address the issue at hand, um, how I'm going to pray in that way. Uh, third of all, pray with corporate language. Uh, sometimes we pray in a small group, but then we pray uh, uh, as if it's just us and God. And that's okay, that, that's not wrong, but, but, but to be cognizant that you are praying in a group, use plural pronouns. Us and we pray in, in such a way that, that you're not just praying for yourself, but also praying for the other people around you and lifting them up before the Lord. Pray often for those sorts of things that the whole church holds in common. Not just personal requests, but, but, but things that the whole church holds in common. Uh, saying, let's pray to one another should become a way of life, a normal practice. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, um, a Christian martyr in Germany. He said this, it is in fact the most normal thing in the common Christian life to pray together. And so pray together in public worship. Pray together in small group fellowship. Third, pray intimately in your homes, with your spouse, with your children, and with your guests. If you're married, pray often with your husband or wife. Uh, pray often um, because prayer is expected in a Christian marriage. You've got, you've got a man and a woman both purchased by the blood of Christ. <laughs> both uh, believers in the Lord pray together as husband and wife talk with the Lord together learn how to pray often but also spontaneously as things come up as, as, as different life situations come up learn how to say whether, whether the husband initiates or the wife learn how to say let's pray about this let's talk to God about this let's come before the Lord in prayer you know it's so easy as in a marriage uh, situation to, to get into that doer mentality to, to always be on the run, always on the go, but, but neglecting to pray with and for our spouse. Pray as a married couple. Uh, secondly, parents, pray with and for your children. Because praying together, as we said, it's a form of discipleship. It's a way to train them up in, in the home, and that's where it begins. It begins in the home. You know, I had the, uh, the privilege of of having a mother who prayed for me and for my siblings every day of our lives. And, 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 and knowing that I had a praying mother uh, allowed me to recognize that God's grace was working in my life, even when I wasn't always walking with Him. And so your children need to hear you praying for them. And they hear you going before the throne of grace, you know, uh, all, all day long, morning by morning, evening by evening, at the breakfast table, on the way to school, as they snuggle into bed, they should hear your heart. They should hear the kinds of things that you want God to do in their lives. They, they should be able to listen to you pray and, and learn how to pray along with you. The Puritan Thomas Brooks once said, a family without prayer is like a house without a roof, open and exposed to all the storms. We have a duty to pray for our children, to teach our children how to pray, but also to teach them how to pray for themselves. One of the things that you can do in your home is you can start by, by giving your child words and phrases to repeat. You know, repeat after me. Let's, let's pray this prayer together. And, and it just starts out small. And it starts out um, kind of uh, by, by listening. And then you grant them more and more opportunities to pray as, as, as their prayer life grows. 
Here are some of the values of teaching your children to pray. One, it demonstrates to your children that prayer is vital. It trains them in theology and godly reason and in piety. It reminds you that your children have souls. <laughs> I know that's weird, but, but sometimes we, we think about our children and we forget that they have souls, that they have an eternity ahead of them, that the God has a destiny for them, but, but prayer reminds us that, that they are meant to have a relationship with God. Prayer affirms the fundamental equal spiritual identity of both parents and children as the children of a heavenly father. It's true that you're the parent and they're the child, but you're both children of a heavenly father. You, you are brothers and sisters in Christ if, if, if you're both coming to faith in Christ. Prayer unites families in long-suffering and mutual love as they confess their sins together. Some of the most precious times in, in our home are, are when uh, maybe my wife and I, we, we do something wrong and, and we've got to come before our kids and we've got to say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? Uh, or when our kids have done something wrong and, and we encourage them and we prompt them and we show them how to come before the Lord and to come before us and to say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? These times of confession. Prayer humbles both parents and children with the acknowledgement that they cannot meet their own needs. They are not self-sufficient. They are dependent upon the Lord in prayer. It's, it's so easy as parents to, to want to feel like we're in charge, to, to want to feel like we've got it all together, like we know what our kids uh, need to have, we know what our home needs to have, and yet prayer reminds all of us that we are God-dependent, that we are reliant on our Heavenly Father. Prayer comforts families in the midst of grief and trial. Prayer orients families in the midst of blessing and joy. Prayer disciplines both parents and children in the regular habit of prayer. Sometimes our prayer meetings in the home, they're not a whole lot. They're just something that we've done, but, but it gets us into that routine. It teaches us this habit of coming before God on a daily basis. Prayer reinforces and proclaims the spiritual priority of a Christian home. Prayer reminds that this home belongs to God. Uh, this home is following Christ. This home is submitted to our Lord and Savior. That's what prayer does. And so it's a privilege to pray together in the home. It's a privilege to rejoice in answered prayers. Uh, you know, this past year, my wife and I, we, um, uh, we served on missions in Japan, but, uh, but, but leading up to this trip, I was having trouble getting my passport renewed. It, it was in the mail, it was with the, the federal government somewhere, and it just wasn't coming, and so uh, we got our family together, and we just started praying. And every day we would pray, we were praying for God, to, for Daddy's passport to come in the mail, and, um, and we prayed, and we prayed, and we prayed daily. We had other people praying, we had the church praying, and, and, and we couldn't do anything else but pray. Uh, because it was in the hands of God and the U.S. government, and, uh, and so we, um, we just planned for the trip. We planned for the trip, we, we, uh, we bought our tickets, um, we prepared to go, we, we, uh, we, we connected with our, our missionaries out there, and, and the day before I was scheduled to fly out, my passport came. <laughs> and, uh, and God answered the prayers, and, and one of the things that it showed our family what was that when you come before the Lord with a need, when you come before God with a need, by His grace, He will very often answer those prayers just to show you that He's God, just to show you that He's able, that He's powerful, that He's amazing, that He's wonderful. And that's the kind of joy that you can show your family when you are praying together in the home. And so um, praying together, it strengthens the church's influence in the home, in the church, in your ministries. And so I want to encourage you to commit to praying together as a church family that the Lord will bless your ministry. Let me pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for CIBC. I thank you for the blessing of this weekend, for this retreat. Lord, I pray that uh, not just now, but for years to come, Lord, you would make them a praying church. You would make them a church that, uh, that, that people come to and, and they say, what, what's, one of your, what's one of your foremost ministries? What drives you as a church? And they would be able to say, and others would be able to see, this is a church that loves to pray together. This is a church that comes before the Lord in, 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 in prayer and praise and wonder and awe. 
God, I pray that that this would be a God-dependent church. And I pray that each one of the homes represented here would be filled with families that are also dependent on you in prayer. God, I pray that this would be the character of this church and that through it you would bless them and give them great power and great influence and great ministry because of their dependence on you. Lord, I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.